All right, welcome back, everyone. Next up, we have David Gomez, who's going to be talking about a subject near and dear to my heart, testing, testing, just get testing, please. <laughs> welcome, David Gomez. Hello, everybody. I'm, I'm David Gomez. Um, I am part of uh, the Yahoo Search front-end team. And this is forget everything you know about testing and start testing. So in the Yahoo Search front-end platform team, we are working on the next generation platform for the front-end using Mojito and, of course, YUI. There's a talk tomorrow about the Mojito ecosystem we are working on, if you are interested in this. But this talk is about testing, testing as a discipline inside the software development process. Um, and I want to tell you a little story about where the idea of this test came from. Not so long ago, I was in a meeting where the Yahoo Search quality engineers were showing their testing strategies and their testing tools. And in that meeting, there were all kinds of uh, engineers, front-end engineers, back-end engineers, um, you know, product managers. And when it was time for Q&A, most of the questions that people were asking were about the concepts and the terminology the quality engineers were using. And then I realized that uh, even senior developers or whatever level the, they have, most of them were not really familiar with these terms. The, for them, all these words and all these concepts were like a very great thing. And it was causing a lot of confusion, right? So I decided to try to explain a little bit more about all these terms. And that's, this talk is the result of, of that process I've been thinking about. Um, around the same time, I was reading some philosophy. That's what I do when I'm bored. Um, and I found a couple of ideas that I think they are related to this problem of concepts and interpretation of concepts. This good-looking old man is one of the uh, greatest philosophers ever is Martin Heidegger, and I have a couple of his ideas that I want to apply to, to this testing subject. Um, the first one is about tradition. He says that when tradition takes over, uh, it, it takes over what we are doing, it pretty much blocks our access to this, the original sources where we got this, the concepts. And tradition makes us forget that these concepts at some point had an origin, and it makes us think that we don't really need to go back to the sources, and we just have to take for granted what tradition tells us to do, right? Without even questioning. And the second idea is, he says that in order to change the world, in order to, to change something, uh, we need first to change the concepts we have on this we are trying to change. And this change is only possible by a new interpretation of this concept, new ideas, right? A new look of this things. So keep in mind these two ideas. I will go, I will go back to, to them um, along the talk. Um, so this is one of those talks that you're probably not going to learn much. Uh, that's what I want to do. That's what I want you to do. I want you to forget what you know and try to unlearn these concepts and hopefully find new meaning and understanding. Go back to the sources and understand what they are all about. Um, so what are these concepts I'm talking about? These are our usual suspects. Um, I'm pretty sure that at any point in your development process, you've heard some of these concepts, like unit testing, smoke testing, regression, integration, etc. But what they mean really, right? Everybody has a different idea of what they mean, and everybody does it a little bit different. And even if you go to a lower level, to the level of the, the tools and frameworks that we use to test, there are even more, more concepts, like if you are in the X-unit world of testing, you know about test suites, test, test cases, and assertions, and all these things. And if you go to another kind of philosophy of testing, such as like behavior-driven development, you will find even more concepts, like features, scenarios, and things like that. And the truth is that most of the times, these concepts refer to the same things, right? They are just like different approaches to the same thing different views to, to the same problem. So the important thing here is to understand the problem first, and then just choose which side you want to look at. Um, because the problem here is that whenever we get used to using concepts as, as traditionally are used, just blindly without questioning them, they will be a source of confusion. Um, 
they will get uh, they will get you into problems such as incomplete requirements or false expectations and unmet goals right and the truth is that we tend to assume that whenever we are using a term or a concept everybody is in the same channel and we think that everybody understands and have in their mind the same idea that we do but this is far from true right everybody can have a slightly different interpretation and it's a very common communication problem so um, we need to first understand, like we need to go back to the source. If we are trying to get tests into our development process, we need to understand why, why we do this testing, right? What is it about? Um, and I think there are two main reasons with what, why we do this. Um, first of all, modern software, modern applications are increasingly complex. We have a lot of moving pieces. We have distributed services, we have cloud services, content delivery networks, we have multiple devices, multiple versions of uh, browsers. So it's getting crazy and it's getting very difficult for us to test in a good way, right? And of course, time is always against us. We are always trying to release sooner, release faster, be the first ones to the market, get, uh, you know, beat the, the competitors, get our expectations, etc. So we test because we want to get this complexity delivered on time with quality, as simple as that. And uh, it is also very in, uh, important to understand not only why we test, but why we don't test. What is it that is stopping us from you know, incorporating all these good practices into our everyday development process in order to you know, go around these obstacles and, and get better quality software? So why we don't test, and this is from my experience as a developer and as a tester, I've, I've done both, both roles. Um, and one of the most important, in my opinion, is that we are overconfident of ourselves, right? I'm pretty sure everybody here is a rock star developer and a superstar, and we are all very good. But how many times you've heard or said even, uh, you know, I'm just changing one line of code. I'm just changing one parameter in my function. I don't need to test. Really, you don't need to test? I mean, are you sure it's going to work? So it's not about confidence in yourself. It's about proving that it works, right? And making sure it works and it's not going to break. And the second problem is most of the times we don't have enough support. And we, don't, we never have enough time. We never have enough resources, enough people, enough testers. And it's very important to understand that testing is an investment and it's very difficult to convince other people, convince managers, convince uh, you know your other team members that testing is an investment and it, it is an investment because of course it requires time, it requires resources but as any other investment if it's done correctly it will bring you benefit, a lot of benefit. So these two ideas combined, not enough support and overconfidence makes us think that tests are an obstacle. How many times you've heard something like, you know, my code is ready, but I still have to write my test, and I have this pre-commit hook, and I cannot commit, so you have to wait, and you know, my tests have more lines of code than the actual code that I'm trying to test. So we start thinking about tests as a burden, as something that is stopping us from doing our work. And eventually we stop caring about tests. And we think of tests as some nice to have feature, something that, yeah, it's okay, it's uh, whatever, but we don't need it, right? We can do it later. Um, and what happens is that you spend a long time fine tuning your application. You have your shiny new application getting ready for production, but on the production release date, everything blows up, right? I'm pretty sure that you have heard stories like this, even in the news recently. And, uh, I mean, nobody wants to be there. And another thing that can happen is that once you're in production, there's a huge security hole that you're finding there. <laughs> and, you know, it's really scary to play with user data and privacy issues and things like that, right? So nobody wants to be in this position. Um, and, of course, once something like this happens, you have to explain why this happened. How come nobody noticed this? How come nobody tested that? So 
you will be in a very uncomfortable position. Um, and if this hasn't happened to you yet, it's not probably because you're very good, because I'm sure you're very good, but it's most likely because you haven't been around long enough to see it happen. It will happen to everybody, and it has happened to any of us. Um, so now we understand, or we are getting an understanding of why we do testing and why, what is stopping us from doing testing. But now, how do we do tests? So the name of this talk is just forget about everything and start testing. So how do we start testing, right? And I have two main ideas about this. The first one, this is about finding the critical path. I got this idea from a talk by Jason Huggins, who is the original creator of the Selenium tool, which is a very, com a very popular testing framework. Uh, and basically what it means is finding those critical components or critical features in your application that have to work no matter what. Right? If one of these features is broken, your application is completely useless. So you need to, to identify these elements and make a, some kind of priority list about them and focus on those features and start testing from these features before going to the full application, right? So start little by little, but focus on the most important things first. And the second idea is test soon and test often, right? And this means using uh, tools such as, you know, continuous build, continuous integration, using pre-commit hooks to run your test. And uh, you will find, once you identify your critical path, you will find that it is composed by several steps. And these steps are most likely related to each other. They have dependencies to each other. So you can figure out the order on, in which you need to start testing. And each of these steps will probably require a different methodology for testing and different tools for testing as well. But uh, once you know what you're going to test, so keep doing it. Do it, test every, every single step. Even ideas like um, running tests on every pull request or on every commit, this will help. And this is what test tune and test often is all about. So, I'm not giving you the holy bible of testing here, but I'm giving you the testing mantra. And this is simply three steps. Know yourself, it means know your code, know your application. Like I said in the beginning, uh, software and applications nowadays are extremely complex and there's really no single person that knows everything. There are huge systems. But focus on what you're working on, know every single piece of your code, and this will naturally lead you to finding your critical path. Once you know how your code works, how these, are, how these pieces are interconnected, then your critical path comes just naturally. And the third point is a mindful practice, which means test and test and test all the time. And it's a mindful practice because it's not only enough to test, it's not only enough to run your test, and it's not only enough to see the green flag in some kind of system, but you need to go into the test results, and you need to understand the test reports, you need to understand what happens when something fails, what does a test uh, failure mean, how can you fix it. So you have to be smart on, on this. You, you can just accept uh, uh, your test results as, as a tradition, right? You see green and okay, that's, everything is fine. So, like I said before, once you identify your steps in your critical path, and you will find that these uh, steps require different types of testing, we need to know what are the types of testing that we can use, right? And this is where I come back to these usual subject, um, usual suspects that I show in the first place, uh, the concepts that we have, like smoke tests and regression and all this stuff. And this is where this philosophy part comes in. I'm going to try to rename them. so you know how the actual name of it is not really important. What is important is what you get from these kinds of tests. So the first one is most of the developers are somehow familiar with unit tests. So they have heard or done any kinds of unit tests. I'm going to call them bulletproof tests. Why is that? Because they are very close to, to you. They are very close to the heart of your code, right? They are pretty much one-to-one -to, -one to your public APIs that you're working on or your whatever components you're doing. And uh, these are very important nowadays because 
these are kind of like a key element in all these agile development methodologies, right? Agile development and pretty much modern software development is all about iteration, like little by little uh, improving your application. And this requires, of course, a lot of refactoring. So unit tests help you survive a refactoring. Uh, they help you maintain some kind of backwards compatibility, make sure that a small change in your code is not breaking other pieces. So they are like your first line of defense. But there are also a couple interesting uses of this. And um, there's this talk later about documentation as code, right? But you can think of tests as documentation. This is another use of um, unit tests. And a very interesting example I found is this tool called Cucumber, which is a unit, not unit, but it's a testing framework, which is trying to abstract tests in such a way that they are written almost in English. Like you can see, I hope you can see the, the example. But the important thing or the interesting part here is that they are providing what they call a technology compatibility kit, which is nothing but a test suite that is implementation independent, meaning that you can use the same test kit to test different implementations of the Cucumber tool itself, right? There's a version for Ruby and JavaScript and everything. So the, the cool part here is that they are using tests as some, some kind of design document that can help other people that are trying to implement this tool make sure that it's close to the official implementation. So it's a very interesting usage of this kind of testing. Another of our usual suspects, smoke tests. I'm pretty sure that most of you have heard this term of smoke test, and it's always very like, what does it mean? Why smoke, right? I'm going to call them the shootout tests. And these are very related to the previous one, the the bulletproof test. If you're smart enough, you want to go to a shootout wearing a bulletproof vest, right, like this guy. And the point is that you want to hit your application as fast as you can, as hard as you can, and then make sure it survives, right? So smoke tests are all about this. Are, and it's very closely related to the, the critical path I was talking about. Smoke tests are all about testing your most important features fast uh, in such a way that you can try to detect any possible critical failure uh, as fast as possible. And uh, one important thing is that they will, this smoke test will help you detect these uh, failures uh, as soon as possible and you can react for, uh, you know, fix these features and, and issues that you can find. Um, the next one is functional tests. This is also a very common concept that we have in testing, and most of you have heard, I guess. Uh, traditionally, when you hear about testing automation or something like that, it's, also, it's most of the times referring to functional tests. Like, you, you have heard probably about tools such as uh, WebDriver and Selenium. So most of them are focused on this. And I'm going to call them the matrix tests because they are basically all about simulating, simulating users in an environment that is as much as possible closer to your real environment. This means that you can, for example, simulate user behavior in different devices, like testing in mobile, testing in different browsers. And for this, you can also use like simulated environments such as headless browsers or, you know, this web kit kind of thing like uh, phantom JS and all this. So what you get from these tests is exactly this coverage on different devices, on different environments. And these are very important and very useful because getting this coverage on devices is very difficult to do manually and it's very time consuming, very resource consuming. You need a lot of boxes and machines and you have to spend a long time to try to get this done. And if you have good automation, if you have a good use of these tests, then you will, you will save a lot of time and effort. Um, this is one of, my favorite, uh, one of my favorite kind of tests, load and stress tests. And I chose this image to illustrate it because in the movie, if you have seen it, the master says to the apprentice that, 
what if your enemy is only three inches away from you and you cannot move and you have to hit, right? So she has to practice there. And that's why I'm calling this the three-inch punch tests. And they are very important because nowadays with uh, the type of applications we're working on, uh, it's very likely, and I hope it happens for you, that uh, your application can go viral and can just grow exponentially in a matter of days or weeks. And once this happens, you cannot tell your user, hey, wait, I need to figure out how to scale. Uh, you cannot tell your users to go back and wait for you to figure out how to scale, right? You, you don't have this room for moving. You have to react and you have to be prepared for a huge load in your application. So that's, that's where these load and stress tests are, are useful. And sometimes load and stress as a term are used kind of interchangeably, but there is a very, very small difference between them. Load tests most likely are about testing your application under normal operation conditions, right? Under what you are expecting to be the regular load that they are going to, uh, your application is going to have. And what you get out of a load test is your normal operation numbers, right? For example, you get uh, how much memory your application is using, what is the average network latency, what is the, the CPU usage that you expect under normal conditions. This will give you some kind of a baseline. And the stress test is similar, but here in a stress test you start ramping up the load until you reach a point where it breaks, right? So what you get out of a stress test is exactly that point where your application stops responding or where your code just breaks. And with these two values, you get the baseline for normal operation, you get the maximum point, and this range you got there is your three inches where you can move to react whenever you need to get, for example, uh, set alarms to detect when something is needing more resources, and it will help you do some kind of capacity planning, right? So you know when to get more resources, what kind of resources you need, maybe you need to scale your backends only and your frontends are okay, etc. Um, another type of test is performance test. This performance test is closely related to the previous um, two types of tests, but the point here is to get um, to know how fast you can go. I'm calling them the Speedy Gonzalez tests. What you want to know is how fast you can go. In, for us, like we are mostly front-end engineers, this could mean, for example, knowing how fast our application is loading into the browser or what's our network latency. And, and we could know with this that maybe we need to use content delivery networks or we need to bundle up our resources. And all this comes from doing this kind of tests. And the truth is that these three types of tests, load, stress, and performance, they are only as good as your instrumentation is, especially for, for performance. Um, if you are using very good tools for, I mean, such as, for example, uh, profilers or things like that, actually in Mojito, in search, we are working on some kind of debugger and profiler to know how, how much time each uh, component, each module in our application is taking to execute. So if you have all this information available, this test will be, you know, super valuable because they will help you find these bottlenecks, these pieces that are slowing you down. And when you, whenever you want to do performance and, and improve the performance and tune your application, you know exactly where to start because you know which parts of your application are taking more time. Um, for these three kind of tests, it's very important to know that you need uh, dedicated environments to run these tests. And this, I, I'm mentioning this because it's very important and it's very difficult to convince people, especially people that is providing you with the resources. It's difficult to, to, for them to understand that you need some spare environment that nobody is touching and you are only using a few times in your release process. But you really need to be sure that you are not getting some kind of noise from for example, let's say you are testing your network latency, then you want to be as close as possible as your real uh, server so you don't get any external you know, latency from another hop on the network or whatever. 
or if you are testing, for example, some database system, well, you don't really want to hit, of course, your production environments. You, you want to have dedicated test testing environments that are pretty much uh, the same setup as production, but with different data and things like that. So I was just trying to mention. But this concept also applies for unit tests, for example. All these concepts about using mocks and stops and things like that, it's pretty much the same. You don't want to test against uh, the real backends or the real services because you want to be in control of what you are testing in order to actually exercise your real code. Um, another type of, another very common type of test is this regression test. Sometimes people uh, call this uh, integration tests. Oh no, no, sorry, this is not, this is the next one. Regression tests, uh, I'm gonna call them the circle of trust test. What are these about? Most of the times, um, regret, um, yeah, regression tests are about finding out what went wrong in the past and making sure it doesn't happen again, right? So if you had some, something that was failing, you create a test case specifically for this corner case and you make sure that it won't happen again and you make sure that you are testing it constantly. And these tests are only as good as your systems for tracking these incidences uh, are good. Uh, if you have a good way to make a relationship between a bug report with an actual test case implementation, if you have a way to keep track of this, and if you have a way to also keep track of your testing history, then these regression tests are going to be very valuable because in, in practice when you're doing testing, it's very easy to miss something because you have priorities. And most of the times these are like very specific cases and if you don't have a way to log all these incidences correctly, then you will miss it for sure. Um, this is the one I was talking about before. End-to-end -end tests are um, commonly referred as integration tests or something like that. I call them the Blade Runner tests. If you remember this movie, if you have seen it, the Blade Runners are like detectives that are trying to find some androids that are passing as humans. But this is a very difficult process. They have to do a very detailed questioning and they have to monitor like every single piece of, every single response of, of this, the, these androids that are trying to be humans. So um, I found it related to end-to-end -end testing because end-to-end -to -end tests are also very in-depth testing. It's a um, very detailed process. And it's all about testing, getting all these pieces that you have tested individually in isolation, like your backend in isolation, your front in isolation, your data, your services and get them all together and make sure that they work as expected once you start using them, right? And this is typically done kind of at the end of the development process or closer to the end of the development process that when everything is ready and you want to make sure that all these pieces can really play well together. So uh, I was going very fast because I had a lot of concepts to cover, uh, but I hope this, this will help you understand a little bit more about what you can get out of these individual pieces of, of um, testing. And trying to get to a conclusion, what I want to do is first go back to these ideas of tradition and finding new meanings to concept. And the point here is that you will have to find a testing strategy that works for you. And this means that most of the times as, a, as developers, we are using tools or we are using methodologies or techniques that, that we use them because everybody is doing the same thing or because it's the latest trendy thing and we want to use it, right? But this doesn't work all the time. So you have to find whatever it works for you and stick to it and, and use it. And you have to be smart and you have to uh, think ahead of what you're doing and always go back to this concept and always question what is it you're doing in order to do it better. And eventually, if you are successful in finding a testing strategy that works for you, you will notice that your testing process is going to be better, but also your development process is going to be better. You will have uh, less, main less maintenance costs. You will have uh, less bugs, of course. You will have better quality software, better quality products. 
So be uh, uh, a good friend with Tess. I mean, Tess are going to, to become your, your best friends. Um, something I would like to see as a personal note in the future is same way we have these kinds of uh, design patterns for software and, you know, best practices. I think in testing there are also common practices and common problems and common solutions for these problems that we could try to get into a more academic kind of way. I would like to see more people trying to write and study about what, why testing is important and how can we do more common, um, more common solutions for, for common problems. And like I said, learn to love your tests and they will become your friends and you will have a lot of fun. Um, uh, I'm David Gomez, um, here's my contact. I'm going to start a Tumblr blog about all these concepts I'm talking about, so hopefully I will have more time and more space to expand these concepts, and if you want to follow me, there's a contact, and that's pretty much it. Does anybody have any questions? We have time for one question. I'm going to try to keep it moving along. We're running a little bit behind. So raise your hand if you have a question. OK, please find David after the talk in the hallways and whatnot if you wanted to follow up with him directly. Um, thank you, David. Thank you.